Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Kilger, Managing Editor of Feeding Grain and host of the Feeding Grain Podcast. Today, a bit of a special event. We have two guests joining me to talk about the U.S. Grain Council's recently released annual corn harvest quality report. Kurt Schultz, Senior Director of Global Strategies for the U.S. Grains Council, and Reese Kennedy, Assistant Regional Director for the Middle East and Europe at the USGC. They're nice enough to call in from Tunisia. But before we get into the conversation, I have just a little bit of housekeeping. If you're listening to this podcast within a podcast app, please consider subscribing or leaving a review. It would really help us out. If you have an idea of a topic you would like me to cover or someone in the animal feed, grain handling, or related industries who you think would be a good guest, let me know. I'd be happy to have them on. Just go to this podcast page on feedinggrain.com, and there's a little button at the top. Uh, right under the title that will let you send an email directly to me. I'd love to hear from you about anything, really. All right, enough of that. Uh, On to the conversation itself. Thank you so much for joining me today, Kurt and Reese. Do you mind telling me and the listeners a little more about yourselves and what you do with U.S. Grain Council? Sure. My name is Kurt Schultz. I'm the Director for Global Strategies with the U.S. Grains Council. I've been engaged with the Grains Council for over 23 years. Um, and my focus is really on the international customers and how we can promote U.S. corn, barley, and sorghum and the coal product exports. And so it really is trying to be that bridge between the farmer, producer, the agribusiness members, and our, our international customers. Yeah, I'm, I'm Reese Kennedy. I'm our assistant regional director for the Middle East and Europe. Formerly, I was stationed in Washington, D.C. and was the manager of global trade, where I did a lot of our economic analysis and and provided a lot of context for what was going on in the market to our overseas offices. Now, I'm in an overseas office in Tunis, Tunisia, is where I'm stationed, working on Middle Eastern markets and European markets and certain markets in Sub-Saharan Africa. Depending on the country, the work looks a little different. If you go to Europe, it's more sort of governmental issues, uh, market access issues. You go to the Middle East, there's a little more development that could be done, more technical trials. And then if you go down into sub-Saharan Africa, things get a little bit more sort of base level development and and diet evolution, let's say. That's kind of where I stand with the council. But I I give context about being manager of global trade because, as you know, we'll talk about the corn quality rollout. And and it was something that I, I worked, or the corn quality report, and it's something that I worked on for quite a few years and I'm quite familiar with. And it's a, a great report that Kurt's put together some time ago. A lot of people listening might not quite know what the U.S. Grain Council does. You mind giving us a little bit of its history and what what the organization does as a whole? Yeah, let me jump in here and just say that the U.S. Grains Council was formed in the 60s. Its mission is to develop markets internationally for U.S. grain producers and to really promote the export of these grains. And so uh, that happens in many different ways. And we kind of have three pillars of of programming that we work in. We work on issues such as trade policy, breaking down governmental barriers or restrictions that might inhibit the export of U.S. grains to the market. We do development programs, as Reese was alluding to, in in countries such as uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, but we do that across and historically have done that across the world. We were very much involved in helping develop the Asian livestock industries and more recently the the livestock industries of North Africa and and, uh, Southeast Asia. So the idea is the development of these sectors happens. They're looking for grains that will help efficiently feed a growing livestock industry that ultimately benefits the consumers with cheaper meat protein. The final part is the marketing component. And the harvest quality report that we're going to talk about is really a a marketing document. It's really updating the markets on the latest information on the U.S. corn quality. But we do marketing symposiums around the world, whether in the United States, where we bring international buyers, or we do them in countries to really introduce agribusiness members and U.S. producers to our international customers. Let me wrap back on uh, one other item, which was who are our members? Our members are composed of corn producers who are represented through their state associations, most commonly uh, the state checkoffs. So corn checkoff or barley or sorghum checkoffs will become members of the U.S. Grains Council because they're interested in seeing uh, building markets for their their grains. So it starts out with the, the producers, but then 
We also include in our membership pack our business members and the value chain from seed companies all the way to grain exporters who are a part of this industry that are very much interested in being engaged in the international market. We are the organization that kind of encapsulates that whole umbrella of diverse interests into one single organization. Well, that's great because we need someone out there advocating for us, contrary to popular belief, right? It always sell itself. Well, you guys have done great work and we've actually been following U.S. Grains Council for listeners interested. They have a long standing, I think it's been three or five years now, a actual column in feeding grain. And just because of what you're doing out there is so important. As you guys have alluded to a few times now, you guys recently launched the Corn Harvest Quality Report, which you do every year. That kind of goes over, well, the, basically the state of the last year's harvest for the world. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about the Corn Harvest Quality Report and how you put it together? The history of it, you know, Kurt may have to touch on the history a little better because it was sort of his brainchild some 12 years ago. And this is our 12th report this year. It's a tool that we put together where we contracted with a consulting firm that sends out what we call kits. These kits include plastic bags to take a sample. They include sampling instructions and prepaid postage back to the lab that's stationed in Urbana, Illinois. So what they did this year, they sent out 600 kits. We got 600 samples back from strategic areas around the U.S. So when you look at some of the corn that might be grown in West Texas, for instance, none of that really goes to export. It's all fed right there at the local feedlot industry. And so we don't collect any samples from West Texas. And that, that's just an example. There are quite a few other examples I could give. But across the Corn Belt, we're collecting samples and we're dividing them into what we call export catchment area. Certain areas may spread well to Mexico and other areas, particularly the Dakotas and Minnesota and Western Nebraska, spread very well to our Pacific Northwestern ports. And then when you look at the majority of the Corn Belt, it uses our river system and goes out through the Gulf to New Orleans. So based upon planting intentions for the year and acres planted via USDA data, they strategically send out a number of kits to different agricultural statistical districts or ASDs around the country. From there, they collect samples, they bring them in, and we test a, a number of things. So I think obviously when you talk about domestic trade, many people look very regularly at USDA number one versus number two, three, four, five down the sample grade. That's very common, but we're also looking a little deeper in the chemical composition. So some of our international customers care about the protein content in corn, which I know may sound weird to certain grain processors in the U.S., but it's certainly a reality for some of our international customers. We look at true density. We might look at hard endosperm corn for people who are making snack foods. So you know, we just have so many customers around the world that are so varied and have so many varied interests. It requires us to kind of look at quite a few different things. And then the last thing we test, and this is something we've been adding on to in recent years, has been mycotoxin. It's an increasing concern from international customers, not just for U.S. corn, but for other origins as well. So we provide them with some information on that as well. Let me just add to what Reese said, which is the report is really intended to focus on our international customers. It's not necessarily to be a complete comprehensive report that might reflect some of the domestic users. It's really the point of first sale, where it moves off the farm to a, an elevator, and that that elevator theoretically then feeds into our export catchment areas. It also is an early indicator. We follow up this report later this year with an export cargo report, which is really sampling the grain at the export elevators. All this data is just intended to give our customers internationally an idea, a perspective of the quality, how does it relate to previous years, the five-year average being an example, but how does it relate to that as an indicator? And, and so that helps them have some confidence as they start to purchase the U.S. corn crop. It's for international. I also like it mainly because it's a lot nicer to read than some of the USDA reports out there. So from that standpoint, I personally love it, even though I am in the domestic market. To the meat of it, how does the 2022 corn harvest compare to past years? How are we looking at this year's corn crop? We had a good harvest. I think all things considered, you know, things looked pretty good. I mean, test weight was on par with what we're used to seeing in past years. So it's, you know, 58 and a half pounds per bushel. It's number one corn. Uh, and, and Kurt talked about how we have the export cargo report. Again, this is the harvest report. So this is all point of harvest. 
Um, so it's not it's not the point of export. So we will see a lot of number one metrics here coming off the farm. One thing we saw this year that's kind of unique to other years is a much lower damage number. So sometimes, particularly in a wetter year, we might see some mold build up there in the field. And we'll see some damage numbers be a little bit greater. This year, damage was very low, so no problems there. Moisture was about on par with what we usually see. We saw a little bit higher protein in the corn, just, just ever so slightly, just coming in under 9% at 8.8%. Starch content was a little bit lower, but we can talk about U.S. starch content versus other origins in a moment. But it was a little bit lower than we've seen in the past, but still hovering around a 72%, while oil was at 4%. And one other thing that really stood out was uh, the, the horniest endosperm or the hard endosperm corn. Normally, we see about 81% of U.S. corn be hard endosperm. This year, it was 88%. So there was a, there was a significant jump between this and the five-year average of 81%. And really, we've never seen a number this high. So you know, a lot of that has to do with the seed type that people are planting. I can't necessarily get into the specifics of why, but that's really what, what we saw. It kind of kind of jumped off the page this year. All right. Uh, well, Reese, you told me you were going to tell me about starch. <laughs> so, oh, sure. I, I mean, we talk about U.S. and this is th- this report is something that other people don't have. When I say other people, I mean other origins. This is a report that other origins don't have, um, and so it's a it's of great value to our international customers, and it's something that allows for them to have an idea of what's coming off the field. You know, you can see a lot of different things in news articles that may talk a, a certain way, but it's a different thing when you have hard data that's taken consistently and it's just very blunt. It's very frank data. There is nothing, nothing other than what we have observed in this report. And so we're out here marketing the U.S. advantage, and, and this is one way that we do it. And another way we do it is via starch content. We've, we've talked about, you know, starch content in the U.S. is roughly the same as other origins. There is a very similar amount of starch. However, its accessibility is higher. And that goes not only for feed milling, but also for wet milling, where that is the name of the game. So it's the seed technology we have in the U.S. is just ahead of a lot of other origins in its ability to to perform. And it's a lot of that, I think, is due to the ethanol industry. The ethanol industry has been about extracting starch. And so folks have been sort of engineering their seed to sort of fall in line with with the ethanol industry. It's really interesting, actually. So that's one of the advantages kind of U.S. corn has over our competitors. Uh, What other advantages does U.S. corn have? Well, I think traditionally speaking, we're pretty low mycotoxin crop. Some years we do see vomitoxin or Dawn pop up in certain parts of the corn belt because it's just a little wet. This year we saw, you know, there's been some articles and some news reports about U.S. crop being unusually high in vomitoxin. That is not the case this year, or at least our data suggests that vomitoxin has been at a fairly normal level as we've observed over the past 12 years. So very favorable on the mycotoxin side of things. We, we don't tend to see a lot of that, whereas in other maybe hotter countries, you'll see more aflatoxin spread. Outside of that, you know, you need to look at the U.S. as a system. I need to look at our logistics system and how it performs and is superior to other origins. There are many reasons why ports get shut down around the world, but I can't remember the last time, other than a natural disaster, that a U.S. port was shut down that moves grain. So, you know, outside of the occasional hurricane, we have a very reliable logistics system. And even if New Orleans is shut down, you can move to the PNW. We have ports on the East Coast that load bulk grains. We have container options for shipping, which People do buy containerized corn in the export markets. We have a lot of that going on. And lastly, it's transparency. We have the USDA Federal Grade Inspection Service that provides grades. It's a a third-party service. We have all the inspection agencies that you could desire that provide grading services. The transparency of our system is far greater than you'll get anywhere else in the world. And then how do you guys kind of use that information then to sell U.S. corn to the world? What do you guys do to market it? Yeah, so this is kind of a given at this point in the Grains Council. We have many offices around the world, and and at all those offices, we host what are called corn quality rollouts. Sometimes it's just in one location. Many times, particularly for our regional offices, it's what we call a roadshow, where they will go country to country and city to city, and they will bring outstanding farmers from the U.S. They'll bring agribusiness to conduct business while they're there, and we'll present about the crop. 
And we'll also talk about other things, you know, how to use DGS and animal diets or risk management, if that's needed. And we get our members involved. And we have our, our farmers talk about their farming practices and brings a more familiar touch to, to U.S. grain. It's something that our, our international customers like to hear. They want to hear how old your farm is and how many generations it's been passed down. These are good stories to tell. So it's a given every January that these rollouts are going to happen. So first of the year, I'm sure there will be plenty of news articles that come out about U.S. Grains Council going around the world to promote this information. Yeah, I love following those stories. I've seen a few where first you have the kind of in-day office thing, right? And then you go out, you go to the feed mill, you go to the grain elevator, you go to the farm. They look like they actually look kind of fun. They can be, but I'll tell you, they are, they're very tiring and folks, they learn a lot. It's always great for them to come back and, and talk to their board, their farmers in their area and tell them about what they learned because there is knowledge sharing that happens at these visits that really can't be replaced via a Zoom meeting or anything else. Yeah, and I would just add to Reese's comment that it is a relationship building. I mean, a relationship business. And so it's really important for those face-to-face -face conversations, whether it be between buyer and seller, but it's also, I think our international customers appreciate hearing from our farmers about their production practices and the challenges that they face um, and getting that assurance that they are just as vested into the domestic market as they are into the international market. Great. So the final question I have for you guys is how can our listeners get involved and support the U.S. Grains Council and your mission to market U.S. corn and other crops to the world? Let me jump in here and I certainly will let Reese add some comments at the end that I missed. But you know, one of the things that I think is really important yeah, from our agribusiness members is that this is a voluntary report, voluntary participation from our agribusiness members to send samples in for analysis. And we certainly can't do it without their help. You know, So those local elevators that are sending their samples in to be consolidated into a global report is the foundation of the work that we do. So from that perspective, we certainly appreciate that because it's, it allows us to have credibility that we are you know representing a broad swath of the United States and a broad swath of the US corn belt in our report. Secondly, you know we are funded and our membership comes from the states. Uh, we don't do anything. If we get some funding from USDA, but without the support of our corn checkoffs, our barley and sorghum checkoffs, and our agribusiness members, we can't do the work that we are doing in the international market. And so I, from a corn producer side, get involved with your state associations. There are domestic focused organizations and there are international organizations such as ourselves that are out representing U.S. producers. Um, if you're an agribusiness, we invite you to, to join our membership because we are out interacting on a daily basis, 365 days a year with your international customers. And so it gives you really a window to the world um, and a perspective of what they're thinking and the opportunities that exist in the international market. So there are a number of different ways. Certainly reach out to our DC headquarters if you're not sure and talk to our membership and see if there's a role that you can play within the organization because ultimately we are a member-driven organization and without members, we cease to exist. Thank you so much for speaking to me today, guys. And of course, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast and hope you'll be back for the next one. Until then, stay safe out there.